you all for Okay, thank you all for um, inviting me back here to speak. Um, so I'll, yeah, so let me just get started. All right, so I'm talking, we're talking about integer solutions to polynomial equations. So, well, a big open question of the field. So I'm gonna start very general and we'll specialize later is, so well, given, given a degree D, um, is there an algorithm to determine all the integer solutions to all the polynomial equations of, of degree D? In, oh, sorry, sorry, not degree D. D is, in, I shouldn't have called it D. D is the number of variables. So all, all polynomial equations in, in D variables. All right, and so, well, I guess you all know that if you have a, if you have a polynomial in one variable, you can find all the integer solutions in some of the, you know, rational leap test, et cetera. Um, and for each of the degrees from two to 10, it's unknown. So that's why there are nine question marks here. And then, um, and then for D at least 11, it follows from the work on Hilbert's 10th problem by a bunch of people that there is no algorithm. So, so my talk today is gonna to focus on the case of, of two variable polynomials. And so um, these, so, okay, so this is, inter, this is about integral solutions to a polynomial f of x, y equals zero. And then you know, this problem, uh, finding the integer solutions to such an equation, that, that's the equivalent to the problem of, of finding integral points on, on smooth affine curves. Um, I mean, this curve doesn't have to be smooth, but you can always normalize the curve to, to get a smooth curve, and then you can, you can do a reduction. The, the problems, will, you, can, you can figure out the difference between the integral points on one and the other. And, and also, the other, going the other direction, if you know how to, um, if, you, if, if you have an affine curve, then you can always, you can always map it to a, a curve in A2. And, and so, so, yeah, so these are, so that, that's, so, okay, so these, these are equivalent. So from now on, we're gonna talk in more geometric language. So I'll talk about integral points on smooth affine curves. Okay, so um, before going into the, the, the number theory, let me just say a little bit about the geometry of affine curves. So over the complex numbers, if you start with a smooth affine curve, then you can complete it to get a smooth projective curve. And, oh, and all my curves are gonna be geometrically integral as well. So, and so, um, and then, yeah, so then your, your affine curve will be the nice, it'll be this nice curve, smooth projective geometrically integral curve with some number of points removed. So some, some number of punctures. And I'll, the curve will have, I'll call it its genus G and I'll call the number of punctures a little r. And then in terms of those parameters, you can, you can say, you can, you can give a formula for the Euler characteristic of this topological space. And it's, well, it's the Euler characteristic of X minus um, the number of punctures. Okay, and I'm, I'm working my way up to stating uh, Ziegel's theorem, I'm reminding you what Ziegel's theorem says, and, it's, and it applies to hyperbolic curves and where hyperbolic means that the Euler characteristic is negative. And well, because there's such a simple formula for the other characters, you can say exactly when this happens and it, it happens most of the time. Um, so when G is equal to zero, then you need R to be at least three for this thing to be negative. And, and yeah, and then when G equals one, you need R at least one. And for G at least two, um, any R will work. Although we're actually, we're always assuming that R is positive anyway, because we're not talking about projective curves. We always, I'm always talking about affine curves today. Okay, so yeah, so these are so these are the curves that we're going to talk about, where the or the characteristic is negative. Um, all right, so now let me state Ziegel's theorem. And so here's the setup. So start with the number field k, uh, find a set of places, containing all the Archimedean ones, and then this O is the ring of s integers, and so it's the the elements of the number field whose valuation is non-negative for all the places outside s. And yeah, so uh, yeah, and then and then U is going to be well, it's it's as in the previous slide, except now everything is defined over K. So U is U is the a smooth affine curve over K, and then well, to talk about integral points, uh, technically speaking, we should choose an integral model of U. So it's it's an O scheme, and, uh, yeah. So that that yeah, whose generic fiber is U. Okay, and then Ziegel's theorem tells you that if you if the curve is hyperbolic, after yeah, which you you test by base changing from k to the complex numbers, 
Um, if it's, yeah, then the set of integral points is finite. All right, so yeah, so here's, what, here's just one quick example. So if you take, one example is if you take P1 and you, sub, and you delete three points. Um, yeah, and then so that, you can also think about that, that curve as being the curve given by the, the x plus y equals one in gm cross gm. Because, I mean, if you, if you write, if you, if you imagine drawing this curve, so there's, you know, this diagonal line, and then, but you remove the axes, the two axes, because we're looking at gm cross gm, then you're along that line, you're removing two points, and then you're, namely the points where x plus y equals one crosses the x and y axes. And then you also have the point infinity removed because everything's affine here. And so if you take that punctured curve, it just projects onto the x, if you project it onto the x coordinate, you just see you get p1 minus three points. Okay, so, so that's my curve. And then the other characteristic you can calculate, it's two minus three. And so that's, well, I guess you know that we're, we're all number theorists here. We know that two minus three is negative. So, um, so, um, yeah, so the Ziegler's theorem then applies, and it tells you that the set of integral points on this curve is finite. And concretely, what the set of integral points are, what the set of point integral points is, it's the set of solutions to this equation, where, but, but it's in GM cross GM, so that means that X and Y are, have to be units in O. And so they have to be units that add to one. So yeah, so this is sometimes called the S unit equation. And so this is saying that the S unit equation has finitely many solutions. Okay, so that's, yeah, so that's, that's an example. Now the big problem, as you all, I'm sure many of you know, that with the big problem with Ziegler's theorem is that it's ineffective, meaning that it, at least even in principle, it doesn't give you a bound for the, for the, the solution. So, and it do, so, in, so it doesn't give you an algorithm to actually find the, all the solutions. It just, a, it just a, uh, yeah, just a theoretical finiteness statement. Okay, so, so because of that, um, Baker developed a method to, that, that, that I could make, that I could try to, in, in order to, to, in order to uh, make, this, make this theorem effective in some cases. So let me, here's just one version of Baker's theorem, which I mostly took from a, from a, a paper by Bilu. Um, so, and okay, so Baker's original theorem so, okay, this theorem involves a choice of absolute value on a number field. Um, and, I, and Baker originally, I think, I mean, there are probably people here who know the, the history better than I do, but I, I think Baker originally did it for Archimedean absolute value, and then later it was generalized to, to arbitrary, also non-Archimedean like p-adic absolute values. Okay, anyway, what is Baker's theorem says? This, this is his theorem on linear forms and logarithms. So, and the, this general version, you choose a number field, you choose an absolute value on k, and you you, choose, you fix some n elements of the of k. Oh, I guess they sorry they should be the invertible, not zero, invertible elements. Um, and then you fix some real number, positive real number epsilon. And then you look at all the the exponent tuples, tuples of integers, such that this power this power product is very close to one. And very close means it should be sort of exponentially close. Um, relative to the size of the exponents, yeah? So, I mean, so, yeah, but, and so this is, if you take, so this thing, this is close to one, and if you take logarithms of that, that means that B1 times log a alpha one plus dot 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 plus BN log alpha one should be very close to zero. And so, it, so this is, this theorem is telling you that, that it's it's rare for that linear form in logarithms to be very small. So it's it's ex, with finitely many exceptions, it's giving you a lower bound for how close a linear form of logarithms can be can be to zero. Yeah, and the, and the great thing about this theorem is that it's effective. So not only is this set of not only are the are these is this finite set of exceptions finite, but you can actually bound the size of the, of the exponents. And so from this, so there's a you, once you know this theorem, then there's a short argument that I, that that uh, that I guess was due to Baker, is that, that you can use this to compute um, you can the integral points on certain curves. 
I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, it, it's only for certain curves. So you, it, it implies in particular for the S unit equation. Um, and there's some other cases too, but yeah, but it's, it's but the, 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 what I'm, what I'm talking about today is, is, is asking, um, well, what, what curves does it really apply to? How, 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 if you, if you combine this, this, this theorem with, with other, like other methods from geometry, what, what can you actually get out of this method? All right, so, so yeah, okay, so here I'm just copying the, the, the corollary that, that you can compute this. And Yuri Bilu um, found a generalization of, of Baker's, of, uh, well, he generalized the application of Baker's method, used the theorem, combined it with some, uh, uh, some arguments in geometry to prove, to, to expand the, the, the class of curves to which Baker's method could apply. And so he proved that if you have a if you have a curve an affine curve u, that it now not just it's not just necessarily a sub variety of gm cross gm, but it's something that has a map to gm cross gm, and it's not it's not degenerate in the sense that it's not a it's not a subgroup of this. It's, so it's not something like y squared equals x cubed, which inside gm cross gm. And it's not a coset of a subgroup, and it's not a it's not, it's not, or it, and it's not contained in the coset. Well, I guess, yeah. So it's not a constant map, for example. So, um, so if you, if you have such a curve that some, he's some, some interesting curve in GM cross GM or mapping to an interesting curve in GM cross GM, then you, then you can use Baker's method to compute the integral points. Okay. So then, um, well, I mean, so Bilu is, once you know, once, once, I mean, now that Bilu has proved this, the big question is if, if somebody hands you an affine curve, can you figure out uh, whether it has a non degenerate morphism to GM cross GM? I mean, maybe is it possible that all curves over all number, all affine curves over number fields have such a morphism? And well, um, well, that's not quite true. I mean, to, to, I mean, to apply this theorem directly, what you need are, Two independent invertible functions on U, because because those which will those will serve as the coordinate functions of the map from U to GM. In other words, you you have the two coordinate functions on GM cross GM, and you can pull them back to functions on U just by composing with this non-degenerate morphism. And then you want and then to satisfy this non-degeneracy condition, you want those two rational functions on U that are have no zeros or poles on U. You want them to be independent modulo scalars. And so another way of saying that is if you take the group of invertible functions on, on, on U and you quotient out by the scalar functions, then well, that, that finally generated that finally generated group should have rank uh, at least two. Okay, and and to say this, I mean if you think about the divisors of these two independent functions. To say that you have those two independent functions is the same as saying that you have two principal divisors. And those two principal divisors, I mean, they're not, these, these functions are not supposed to have zeros or poles on U. So that means that all the zeros and poles are going to be in the complement, in the, in the set of punctures R. And so what you so this condition is same is the same as saying that you have two independent principal divisors. Um, so Z independent principal divisors on the on the nice on the projective curve X. That are that, by, that are supported on that finite set of points R. And another way of saying that is, um, well, if you have a divisor, a degree zero divisor on X, and you want to know is it a principal divisor, that's the same as asking whether those that divisor adds up to zero in the card group or in the, in the yeah, or in the, you can or you can think of it as the Jacobian if you want. And so having this condition, this is equivalent then to having two independent relations between the punctures um, and the where the relations are supposed to happen inside the Picard group inside yeah okay so 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 it's a it's a sort of a subtle condition it's some kind of arithmetic condition you need to have these points um, have 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 an, have an, have these relations and so I mean there are many curves which you you will not have such relations so I mean a simple example is if you only have one puncture if you only have one puncture if R is just a single point then they're not going to be any relations at all between that one point. So, so yeah. So you need at least, well, yeah. So you need a, you need more than one point in order to apply this method directly. 
All right, so, um, so let me now say that, so, okay, so, okay, so, wait a second, sorry, I think I skipped. Yeah, oh, sorry, okay, yeah, so, um, so, okay, so if, if this theorem does not apply, if you can't find those two independent uh, rational functions to begin to, the, uh, on, on your affine curve, then what you can do um, is you can, you can, well, there are various things you can do. You can try to enlarge the number field or enlarge the set of places S. I mean, that'll just make your ring of S integers bigger. And so if you, even if you can find the finitely many integral points over that larger ring of S integers, then you can also do it over your, the ground ring. But a, a, a more interesting new thing you can do also is to, is to use this, the, what you might call the method of descent, which is where you, re, you replace you by a finitely tall cover. It's an unramified cover of you. And the, and the reason that that's, that's an allowable operation is that it's a, it, it comes out of descent theory that every, that every integral point on u comes from an integral point on u prime. But I mean, maybe not, not an integral point over the same ring of S integers, but over some larger ring of S integers and, and maybe a larger number field. So that means if you can find all the integral points on this u prime over this bigger ring, then you have you have an upper bound for the set of integral points on 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 the original u, and so you can just look look at which you can just look at that look at those points one by one and figure out which ones are actually and figure out which ones are actually integral points on u. Okay, so the upshot of this is that you're always free in 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 solving this problem of integral points. You're always free to replace your original smooth affine curve. By an unramified cover, a finite tall cover. So yeah, so here's, I mean, I, I mean, this 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 reduction I think has been known for a long time. In fact, I'm not even sure where it first originated. I mean, I guess Chevalet and Bay, I know they did something like this, but they're, I think they're maybe, maybe they were considering mostly um, projective curves, but it's a and you can in that case it turns out to be a statement about rational points, but. Anyway, and it might even be older than that. Like maybe, maybe somebody can tell me what the history is. But anyway, in this context, in, in a, for applying, uh, for combining this with Baker's method, um, this was already done in a paper by Baker and Coates to, to give an algorithm for finding the integral points on an elliptic curve. And when I say integral points on an elliptic curve, I really mean on a punctured elliptic curve, technically speaking. So, so you re we're looking at the affine curve that's given by an elliptic curve equation, like y squared equals x b plus ax plus b. And so, so then, and that's the, that's, so that affine curve is the u. And, and um, the, the ba Baker's method or Bilu's generalization, it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't apply directly to u because there's only one puncture and there are no relations between just that one point. But what you can do is you can replace it by a finite tall cover that's given by the multiplication by two map. So, so the multiplication by two map is an atoll, a finite atoll map from E to E. And if you just restrict it to the part that lies above the punctured curve, then you get a map from, well, you, you get a map from E minus the pre-image of O, which in the pre-image of O is, is the, the four, uh, the four two torsion points. And so this, so this, this is now a, a finite tall cover of this. And, and the advantage, and so now, now you, instead of finding the integral points here, you can, you can try to find the integral points on this U prime. And what has been gained by passing to this finite tall cover is that now you have a curve with more punctures. So now there are four punctures and, and there actually are uh, relations between these points in the, in the Jacobian, namely, well, the, the difference between any two of these points Two torsion points is is something whose that's a two torsion in the Jacobian. So so that gives you some that gives you some rational functions that are that are invertible and have no poles on this. So if, and it's explicitly if you're working in terms of a fire stress equation of E, then and if you call the the x coordinates of the two torsion points e1, e2, e3, then you have these two rational functions, for example, are independent. And they have no zeros or poles on this. So the, the zeros and poles of these are supported on the punctures. And so that means you can apply, um, you can apply, um, you can you can apply Baker's method to this curve u prime and actually 
and, and, and get a bound on the, the size of the integral points on this curve. Yeah, so, okay, so one feature about this example is that, I mean, this was not just a finite and tall cover of U, it actually came from a finite and tall cover of the projective curve of the nice curve E. And so, um, yeah, so anyway, so the, um, all right, so, so, okay, so now the, the question, I mean, which is implicit in Bilu's work is, is whether this always works. Can you, can you always find some finite tall cover that works like this given any, uh, starting with any smooth integral affine curve U uh, of, and I'm, I'm and over, uh, I'll, I'll assume genus at least two from now on because by the, by the baker coates theorem on the previous slide, the genus one curves are taken care of already. So the interesting cases are genus of these two. And well, we're all, they're always over some number of fields. So I might as well just say it's over Q bar. And, and now it's, a, it's sort of a purely uh, geometric question. Is it true that every such affine curve U has a finite tail cover that has a non-degenerate morphism to GM cross GM? In other words, has a finite tail cover to which Bilu's theorem can apply? Because if the answer is yes, that means then then the big problem has been solved. So that then you can determine the integral points on any curve over any over any curve over any smooth affine curve over any number field. And okay, so that's so that's the, the maybe that's the most yeah that's that's the most fundamental question we want to answer. Um, um, we, I, we could ask for even more. We could ask for for well, it's the same question except. I, I want the finite tall cover to come from a finite tall cover of the projective curves of the nice curves, as it did in the in the previous um, in the Baker Coates method, where the I actually started with a, a finite cover of the E, and then I just restricted it to the to the punctured curve. Okay, so these are the two questions that I want to I want to study in the rest of my talk. All right, so well. Let's see. So, okay. So here's, so okay. So here's just a cop. I just copied in here the 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 main question, or this is the second question, and the previous slide. And now let me tell you what I can actually prove. So I can't quite answer this question, but I can I can so I can even though it's a purely geometric question, I I I can I I need I can prove I can prove a negative answer to this if I replace Q bar by an uncountable algebraically close field like complex numbers. So yeah, so I'm saying that um, there is an, as an affine curve of genus at least two over the complex numbers such that no matter what finite tall cover you try to you try to take of it, um, well, of, of where the etal cover is coming from a projective etal, etal cover, um, no, yeah, all none of those finite tail covers will have these two independent rational functions on it. You won't be able to find those two things. And so that's 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 so okay. So this is maybe well, yeah, one of the one of the main theorems. And actually, I prove a stronger version of this. Um, that not not only does this fail for some curve of genus greater than or equal to, it actually fails for every curve of genus at least two. If if you let me put if you let me choose which puncture where I put the puncture, so yeah. So for every for every curve, there exists a point such that it fails if I puncture if I puncture it there. Yeah. So so what this means in terms of algorithms for integral points is that, I mean, if there is a positive solution, if there, if 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 it is possible to use this Bilu's theorem over for curves over Q bar, it means that, well, it, it, there's not gonna be a general, a generic method that works no matter where for all the punctured curves. It'll have to be, a, if, if it works at all, it'll have to be a separate finite tall cover depending in, in an arithmetic way on where the puncture is. So you'd have, it'll, I mean, it'd have to be something like what happens in Belli's theorem. Where there's like there, if you have a, I mean, Belli's theorem is the, where you have if you have a, a curve over. Over over Q bar, you can represent it as a, a, a ramified cover of P one ramified only above zero one infinity. 
but it's not it's not a single construction that works for a given genus. The the the, the construction of the morphism sort of depends on the the, the actual well, it very, depends very much on it being over Q bar, and it's just, and you have to it, the degree of the map depends on the height of the of the of of the, of, of the of the of the curve in that case. And so it'd have to be something similar here. So I mean, you could try. So I mean, uh, various people have done various constructions, whereas for certain certain special curves, you can actually find you can find um, these non-degenerate morphisms, but there's not going to be a general method. For, for a given genus, the way there was for genus one. Okay, so that's so that's that that's what so that's so I actually so we'll actually prove this, um, and actually um, we'll prove some. I mean, for this one, this is saying that if you have a curve of genus at least two, then you can puncture it so that you cannot find these two independent rational functions. In other words, you cannot find two independent you cannot find two independent relations among the pre-images of your puncture in, in, in any F, in any ATL cover coming from nice curves. And um, but you can um, but here is here I can prove something even better, namely that you can't even find one, it not only can you not find two independent relations among the pre-images, there's gonna be some puncture such that you cannot even find one relation between the pre-images at that point. And yeah, so so given, yeah, so, okay. So you can, well, you can read what it says. It says that given a, this is a nice curve of genus at least two, you can find this, you can find some point in it. So if you puncture, if you, if you puncture there and you look at its pre-image, then for any finite tall cover, the pre-images will always be independent in the Picard group of Y. So yeah, so you so that means you, you cannot even get the rank of the of the group of invertible rational functions, module scales. You can't even get it to be at least one, let alone the greater than or equal to two that you would need for Bilu's theorem. Okay, so all right, so I want to explain how 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 I prove this this theorem. Um, and it, it comes from the, uh, another theorem, which maybe, well, maybe this is my main theorem. Can't, I can't decide which is my main theorem, but let's maybe maybe it's this one. So this one, this one actually works not over not just over the complex numbers, um, which but it, it works for any algebraic closed field of character zero. So in particular, it would work for Q bar as well, and it's actually a little easier to prove over the complex numbers, and that would suffice for the previous one. But for the for the, but okay. So what does this say? So. So given a given a given algebraic closed field, so think about Q bar, for example. And now suppose you have any morphism of nice curves of genus least two. Um, it doesn't even have to be fine at all anymore, just, just some surjective map of curves. Then you can find a point little x in, in here, such that if you take the pre-images in, in this one cover y, then there those pre-images are independent. In the Picard, in the Picard group, so no relation in the in the Jacobian. So okay, so uh, so I'll explain the proof of this a little later. But for now, let me just say that you, I mean, in fact, what happens is that for for each, if you given the y going to x, um, if you ask, okay, I mean, this says there exists a point, but in fact, almost a very general point, little x, will work. And in, in, in other words, the, the conclusion will fail only for countably many little x. And so, so, and, and so that means that if you're working over the complex numbers, well, then you, then, well, then, then you, you can use, you can use this, not, you, not just for one y, but you can, you can avoid these countably many x coming from each of the countably many finite tall covers of, y to x. You can apply this countably many times, and you'll still have only countably many bad choices for little x. And so, so that's why this theorem implies this theorem that lets you choose one point over the complex numbers that works for all the finite ATL covers, such that, such that for any finite ATL cover, the pre-images are independent. OK, so. Yeah, so I mean, I would. It would be nice if we could prove 
this theorem also over Q bar, but you would have to use something more, you have to, you, I mean, this argument as it stands doesn't work because you can't, I mean, a countable union of countable sets could be uh, those of count that could be all the Q bar points. So there might be nothing left to choose if you're working over a countable field like Q bar. So if you, so maybe, maybe there would be a way to prove, to prove this theorem over Q bar, but it, but for that, I mean, I would, my guess is you'd have to know something about the heights of the, of the, the bad points in theorem B. If you could prove some uniform bound for the heights of these bad points, uh, for the, for X, the heights of the points X for which this fails, then, then you would get a theorem like this. Okay. So, all right, so, um, so, so now what I want to do um, in the rest of the time, I want to explain the proof. So the, the thing that remains is to prove this theorem B. And so I want to sketch the proof of this. Okay, so, so here's the, okay, so here I've just copied the statement in, in, this, in this smaller text here uh, of theorem B. Yeah, so, so let me just remind you what it says. We're over we're working over a field such as Q bar. We have a morphism of nice curves, maybe ramified. And we want to find a point, little x here, such that its pre-images in Y are independent in the Picard group. So the first thing you can do is you can take this ramified cover and you can replace Y by its Galois closure, which will be a, a higher cover of X. And now it's a Galois cover, and um, but if you if you can yeah, but if you prove it for that higher one, I mean then you will you will also prove it for the original y, because any um, yeah if I mean if you because any, any relation that you have between the preimages and y will give you a relation between the preimages and the Galois cover as well. So yeah, so you can reduce to the case where the cover is Galois and let let G be the Galois group. Um, the other thing I want to assume is that I have an, I can embed Y in a Jacobian in a, in a natural way and a way that respects the action of G. And so one way to do that is, I mean, the normal way, the normal way of embedding a curve in a Jacobian is to choose a base point and use the Avil Jacobi map from Y into its Jacobian. But, but that base point might not be fixed by the group G. And so it might not give rise to an equivariant embedding of Y into J. So what you can do instead of choosing a base point is you can use, instead of that a base point, which is a, a point of, you can use the canonical divisor as your sort of, as a substitute for the based point. And so we're, we're talking about a curve of genus at least two. So the canonical divisor K is, is a positive degree. And you can use this sort of, sort of modified Abel Jacobi map where you, you send Y to, well, you can't send it to like what, I mean, normally you do Y, little Y goes to little Y minus the base point. Um, but that doesn't quite work because this is not degree one. So you multiply the little y by the degree, by 2g minus two, yeah. Okay, so anyway, this is a map from y to j and it's it's a morphism and it's, 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 so, it's so canonical that it, it's, it, it's, it's gonna be equivalent for any group acting on y. Um, um, one, one thing that it might not be is injective um, because it's because of this multiplication that's happening inside the Jacobian, but um, but I mean, often it is injective, and so just for some for simplicity, just so I don't have to say extra words for in this talk, let me let me suppose that it actually is injective. All right, and then what I need is to use this lemma um, that says, okay, so now okay, so I have this curve inside this abelian variety now, this curve winding around inside J, and I want to say that there exists a point in Y that on the curve that outside every algebraic subgroup of J, well, other than J itself. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, in other words, I'm, I'm, I'm intersecting Y with all the algebraic subgroups. I'm saying that there, there is a, outside of that intersection there, I can still find a point of, of Y. And this is, I mean, there are countably many such, such subgroups, H, um, and I, I, by the way, I'm also considering disconnected algebraic subgroups. So for example, this is saying that the Y has to, in particular, has to avoid all the torsion points, for example, and, and all the torsion cosets of algebraic uh, of, of abelian subvarieties of J. 
Yeah, so, um, well, okay, so here's, here's a sketch of the proof of this lemma. So yeah, and, and you can, um, well, I mean, so it, it, I mean, this would be obvious if you're ever over the, or it'd be easier if I were over the complex numbers, because then I could just, I could just say that, well, all the, all these H's are of lower dimension. I mean, if, if each, each H intersects Y in finitely many points and then take, take the union and then the, the set of bad Y's is just a countable set. And so over the complex numbers, it would be easy to find such a Y. But over a Q bar, you have to do a little bit more work. And so, well, um, one way you can do it is to do a P, use a p adic method, which is similar to the method that I used in, in a paper with Davesh Malek for proving, well, for proving something else. But anyway, so you can, this, so if K is something like, it could be something like Q bar, but in any case, you can first restrict to the case where K has finally, finite transcendence degree, because you can just, I mean, because all the input data is defined over some finitely generated field. You just look at the field generated by all the coefficients of all the equations defining Y and J. And, and, and so, um, yeah, and so you can, so, and you can, and you can take the algebraic closure of that finitely generated field. And so you can reduce to the case where that's your new K. And, and if, if, you have, if you have such a K, it's an algebraic closed field of finite transcendence degree, then you, it, it, you can embed that into QP bar because QP bar is a uncountable transcendence degree over Q bar over Q. So in this way, yeah, so now we can work over QP bar and uh, what, and what comes out of this, these arguments in my paper with Moloch is that this, that if you look at all the, the algebraic subgroups and you look at how they intersect Y and you take the union of all those, all those points. So all the points in Y that lie on some algebraic subgroup, then that is, I mean, not only does it not cover all the points, but it's actually not even dense anywhere in any p adic open subset and any non-empty open sets. It's, it's, it's nowhere dense in this set. On the other hand, the k points like the qp, like the q bar points would be p adically dense in here. And so that means you can always find a k point that's outside all these, all this big, this, all, outside all these intersections. All right, so that's that's the proof of this lemma. So so we can forget the proof now and just just remember the statement that there's a point outside all the algebraic subgroups. All right, so now let me continue with the proof of theorem B. So let, let me just summarize where we are again. So we we have a morphism of curves over something like Q bar, and we're trying to find a point here whose preimages are independent in the Picard group of Y. So, and we already reduced to the case where the cover is Gawa, and let me give a name to that, the, the morphism, let's call it F. And we also were assuming that Y embeds into its Jacobian. We have this G equivariant embedding. And the lemma told us that we can find a point of Y that's outside all the algebraic subgroups of J. So, okay, so fix such a Y that's outside all those subgroups. And my punk, my X that I'm going to take the preimages of, that's just going to be the image of Y under, under this map. And so, well, then the preimage of, of that little X, well, it's going to, one of the preimages is going to be Y and all the other, and it's a Galois cover. So all the other preimages are just going to be the other things in the Galois orbit of, of, that, of that Y. So that's what I'm, this, so here, this GY is the G orbit of Y. So those are the preimages. Okay, so I want to I want to be able to say that these preimages are independent in the in the in the in the Picard group of Y. Now, if if uh, so, I'm, I'll do a proof by contradiction. Suppose suppose the suppose are, the preimages were actually dependent, a Z dependent. So that means that there's some Z linear combination of of these Gala conjugates are not yeah are, are the G or there there's some there's some Z. Z and Z linear combination of these points in this orbit that gives that gives zero on the Picard group. So another way of saying that is that there's an element of the group ring, some S, some non-zero element, such that S times Y is zero in the Picard group or in, or in the Jacobian. So so yeah, so this so I, this is what I want to get a contradiction out of. Um, yeah, so, so if you have this, if, you, if S, if you have this group, this group ring element S and S Y is equal to zero, that, that's just the same as saying that Y is in the kernel of S. If I think of S 
as an, as an endomorphism of the Jacobian, um, as a, which is just a Z linear combination of the endomorphisms given by the, the elements of the group G. Okay, all right, so Y belongs to the kernel of S. But I mean, the kernel of S, that's, that's an algebraic subgroup of J. And Y was chosen so that it was not, did not belong to any of the algebraic subgroups of J, except for, of course, the whole J itself. So what this means is that the, the only way this can be true is if the kernel of S is actually the whole, uh, the whole Jacobian. And so, yeah, so, so if the kernel of S is the whole Jacobian, that, that means that S, ki S kills the entire Jacobian. All right, so now we have this group, non-zero group ring element that kills the, that as an endomorphism, it kills the entire Jacobian. And if it, if, and then by functoriality, that, that same S will have to kill the Lie algebra of J. Where, and so I'm thinking here that the, the Lie algebra of J is, it's, I mean, it's a vector space. It's a K vector space, but it's also, it has a G action. So it's, it's a rep, this Lie algebra is a representation of G and it's killed by this, by this group ring element. Okay, so that so we're there. Um, on the other hand, it turns out that for when you when you're in this situation where you have a Galois cover of curves of at least of genus at least two, and you look at the Lie algebra of the Jacobian of the curve upstairs, then it turns out that, uh, and you think of that Lie algebra as a representation of the Gal group, th that it turns out that all the all the irreducible representations of G occur in that Lie algebra. So that means that if S kills this, this representation, that S will have to kill every irreducible representation of G. And if it kills all the irreducible representations, it will also kill direct sums of irreducible representations. So S will have to kill the regular representation of G. But I mean, if S kills a regular representation of G, that, 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 that's possible only if S is zero. And so, so we get that S is equal to zero, but that, that, that's a contradiction since we were assuming that we had a non-zero S that was actually giving a relation. So yeah, so that's the end of the proof. This proves that there cannot be any dependent Z dependency between these pre-images of that, of this X that was chosen as the image of this Y. Okay, so that's the end of the proofs of the theorems. So um, yeah, so I guess I have a little bit of time left. So maybe I'll just end with, with one slide saying uh, where, where should you go from here? So, I mean, so far, I mean, this is not the, I mean, I mean, it's not necessarily the, the death knell for Baker's method, uh, but it, it just means you're gonna have to work harder than if you, if you, if you, if you, th if you still think that this method of Baker's, Baker's, Baker's method together with finite tail coverage, if you, if you still think that this is gonna apply to all smooth affine curves, you're gonna have to work harder. Um, so I would like, so I, I so, and so, so in my talk, I was mostly talking about question two. All my theorems are about question two. Remember the, def the difference between question one and question two is that in question two, we were looking only at the finite tall covers of the affine curve that came from finite tall covers of, of the projective curves. It would be nice if we could prove the analog for, for finite tall covers of just the affine curve itself. So, I mean, in other words, those, those, that means we'd be looking at covers of the affine of the, that's the same as looking at covers of the nice curve that are allowed to ramify above the punctures. So there are more of those. And there, there's still some hope that you could have some generic construction involving those covers to, to, that, to which you could, and, and you could use Belu's theorem for those. Um, yeah, so, so it'd be nice to be able to study those, those finite tail covers of this punctured curve, not just X. Yeah, by the way, it's enough to study the case of, I mean, if you're trying to get a, it's, it's, the, the, it's, it's enough to study just one puncture because um, the problem just gets easier if you put m more punctures. So, it, 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 so the main cases have a, 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 a curve punctured in one point. So anyway, so yeah, so, so we'd like to see if we could do some, some method. So something similar to the way to prove this theorem B for two, but but to apply it to these finite color covers. But I mean, the algebraic geometry. I mean, I, the Lana Garcia uh, theorem is not going to be enough because if if now we're not just looking at one, I mean, 
as we move X around and the, the puncture around an X, the the cover the finite tail coverage it's not just one curve anymore. The the, the finite tail coverage will actually deform because as as little X moves, the ramification locus of the cover is going to be the branch locus of the cover is moving into the curve, the finite cover tail cover is deforming as well. And so um, maybe there's some way to use some deformation theory or something, but um, well, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm trying to work that out. So um, I don't know if it will be able to do that. Okay, so that's one open, that's one possible further direction for this. Another thing is what I mentioned already earlier that maybe it's possible um, to upgrade the some of these theorems that I proved over the complex numbers to theorems over Q bar. Um, yeah, so for example, I mean, going back to this lemma here, maybe, is this known already? I, may, I mean, I think there are people in here who know this better than I do. Is it known that in, if I have a, if I have this curve and, 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 and it's Jacobian here, um, is it known that if I intersect it with all the algebraic subgroups, then all those intersection points um, have bounded height? Is that, is that a theorem? Okay, maybe okay, maybe somebody can tell me after after I finish. Okay, but and, yeah, so the, if that's true, then that would give well, that would be a uniform for this and then. But I, I, ideally, you, you want to do this um, not just for one y over x, but I mean, eventually, in, in for proving the the theorem a double prime, you'd want to take a union of this, so you'd want to have a a height bound that was uniform over all the finite tall covers y of x, to, in order to get the the negative answer for two, for two itself, and, and instead of two over negative answer for two over the, the complex numbers. So, um, yeah, okay. And, and if you well, and if well, if, if I mean, if you end up proving negative answer for for one, well, that sort of kills off that, make, that means you cannot use, um, and then you make uh, you make Yuri Bilu sad because you can't make his method will not apply to all smooth affine curves. So then it's time to invent some totally new approach uh, for it to find the integral points on curves that goes beyond uh, Bicker's theorem and finite tall covers. I, I, I mean, I don't know what that would be, but I guess that's the way it is. Oh, I, okay. So, all right. Oh, I see. Uh, I see your Bilo, Bilo is here. So maybe, okay. Well, I mean, I haven't made you completely sad yet. So, but yeah, so, all right. So I'll end here. So thank you all for your attention.